Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Sinead DeFries, and this is The Daily Show, where we bring you the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us this morning is Dennis Sen. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another brand new episode of Collider Movie Talk. We weren't here last Friday, so mm. I think this is the, the first time I've been on the show with all the new fancy gear. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Really? Yeah. With the Vera so. Zoom? First movie talk. <laughs> right. Okay. Huh. All right. Also here. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up, guys. Just kidding. Also here is John Roca. Hello, everybody. How's it going? Welcome back, Sinead. Nice snowflakes on your shirt. It's so sweet. It's, um, it's all wintry. I love it. <laughs> I was going to wear my Santa hat, but you wore snowflakes, so I didn't, I didn't Oh, Santa bummer. Hat. We could have matched. It would have been adorable. Okay. Also, here is Perry Nemeroff. <laughs> I'm happy to be here, but I'm really sad Roka's scarf isn't here with us today. Oh, yeah, that's true. That would have been the perfect accessory. <laughs> yeah. All right. 20th Century Fox has released a new Assassin's Creed trailer. Through a revolutionary technology that unlocks his genetic memories, Callum Lynch, played by Michael Fassbender, experiences the adventures of his ancestor, Aguilar, in 15th century Spain. Callum discovers he is descended from a mysterious secret society, the Assassins, and amasses incredible knowledge and skills to take on the oppressive and powerful Templar organization in the present day. The movie will hit theaters on December 21st. Dennis, what did you think of the new trailer for Assassin's Creed? What are they doing? I mean, <laughs> are, it's like they purposely don't want people to watch the movie. Like, oh my god! <laughs> when you start the trailer, that was amazing. That was amazing. Yes. I, I I hear the music because Perry started the trailer. I'm like, what what is this? What are you what are you watching? Ready for it? Oh yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh yeah. Like, like night at the rocks right now. This is like shots, shots. And then shots. so I, I start watching and. It, the actual visuals themselves are fine. Yeah. There's a lot of cool action in there, but it's all the only thing you're thinking about is the <laughs> music. Yeah. And I don't understand this trend because we, we just had saw a passenger's it wasn't a full trailer. But it was kind of like a half music video, half trailer thing, which also had music that, that didn't fit what the trailer was about. And you have this one as well. It's like, are they saying, hey, we're, we're giving up on this movie and we're just going to throw things. I, I, I understand. People want to try different things to get atten attention, but this is not the way to go. <laughs> yeah. Perry, what did you think about this trailer? Yeah, I'm with you on this one. <laughs> not only does this music not work with this material at all, but this is like anti my kind of music. I forgot what we were talking about earlier, but like, you know, when you go into clothing stores and they just play house music, mm -hmm. I want out. This thing started <laughs> playing and I just wanted to turn it off. I don't like it. I really, and what I really don't like even more about this trailer and the recent Passengers trailer is that the music does not go with the tone and the content of the movie. It seems like a really weird thing to me, especially when you can take a song and just release a music video. One of my favorite things to have come out of Suicide Squad was the 21 Pilots song, and I thought that uh, music video was great too. Why not have just done that? Because instead what this feels like is, it feels like a terrible song choice paired with a weird ac action montage that kind of just spoiled all the hero shots. Mm -hmm. Work up, what do you think? Yeah, the question is, what do I think of the new trailer? It was a terrible. I, I just, I, I, like Dennis said, I love the visuals as well. But that song, I don't think we're the demographic for that song. That's what's so weird. It feels like what we're talking about here is um, this kind of techno dance type stuff. Maybe they're trying to go for the video game crowd. And maybe that's their point here because they're trying to like appeal to the, the younger kids. They know those are the people going to come and see movie that movie over and over again. And so that's maybe where they're going. And so to me, it seems really a, a weird choice of music and a weird like it just seems. And plus, that voiceover is so strange, too. I was just like, what is this all about? Welcome to the SSS. Well, like, okay, I get it. But besides not liking the music for it, yeah. I hate when when the, the, the music is like the, the lyrics are like so on their own nose. It's like Ezio is coming down and he's yeah. jumping. Le <laughs> yeah. Like they're talking about exactly what yeah. he's doing. And then he's fighting and he's turning around. I hate I hate that. Stuff. It's a commentary Assassin. track song. It's exactly. A it's like, oh, for what you're we're going to do the movie and then we're going to make a song and I'm going to write the lyrics based on exactly every <laughs> movement the guy's going to make. So not only was the music not to my taste, then right. you have that on top of it. I just think they're appealing to the video game crowd. That's what it feels like to me with this 
with this kind of trailer. This is for like 18 year olds, 16, 15 year olds. And so to, to, to older people, it just seems ridiculous. I, not I don't even know. I, yeah, I think I give yeah. every living, breathing person out there more credit than that. I don't <laughs> understand who this is for at all. And well, I'm not saying the, it was effective. The I'm people, saying this is what they were The people for. who it is not for more so than anything, which it could be detrimental to how Assassin's Creed does in theaters. Yeah. Are people that don't know the game yeah. could you imagine if they played this before any movie that came out and someone in the audience had no clue what assassin's creed was what are the chances that this would get them to buy a ticket to the movie yeah. i'm concerned for this one at this point there are there is some beautiful imagery one of my favorite things was uh i think it was kind of like a sunset shot with silhouettes of people on a mountaintop in front there was some beautiful imagery like mm -hmm. that but I, I don't know about this, especially given the competition it's going to be facing at the end of the month. Well, this is concerning because Justin Kurzel is a fantastic director. If you if you saw his version of Macbeth, mm -hmm. that is one of the best filmed versions of any Shakespeare play you will ever, ever see. The visuals, the slow motion, the cinematography, the direction and the pace of that film, and what he got out of Michael Fassbender and Marianne Cotillard, who are there are teaming up again. This is what gives me hope for the movie, but this kind of trailer really undercuts whatever hope you might have. Yeah. All right, what's next? Universal Pictures has revealed a poster and small tease for their reboot of The Mummy. The short video throws Tom Cruise right into the action and finds him fleeing the mythical monster. The teaser also shows us small glimpses of the cast, including Russell Crowe's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde character, while also getting a good look at The Mummy herself. The full trailer drops this Sunday with the movie set for release on June 9th, 2017. Perry, what did you think of the new poster and first tease of The Mummy? Yes. And I can't believe I'm saying yes, because normally I'm so hard on trailer teasers, because I think that's a really silly way to market a movie, because a, a trailer is a tease. Why do you need to tease the trailer? However, the money shot in this particular footage, the iris splitting, mm. the second they did that, my not that I didn't have any faith in this idea, but you know, it's going to be a challenge for them to get this cinematic universe off the ground. Something about that visual just got me so hooked. And, you know, of course, when you look at the poster, that tagline, you know, some I've heard some people say since this drop that, oh, it's strange to reference Bride of Frankenstein in your mummy movie. No, it's not. Not when you're building a cinematic universe. You can drop in that tagline to excite people who know the material that preceded this movie. Then again, it is also a line that can get newcomers hyped about what's to come. I think both things are brilliant. I can't wait to see the trailer on Sunday. Rocket. Yeah, I'm super excited. I'm a massive Tom Cruise fan, so to me, I'm already walking into this excited. And coming off of Jack Reacher 2, which was so terrible, this looks like he's going back to something he really does well. And these kinds of action, just the, just the what, five, ten seconds that he's in that mm -hmm. teaser, you're just super excited that this is the guy you're going with to open this universe. And I think it's great for him at this point in his life to take on this thing and kind of be the rock, the Robert Downey Jr. of this universe. You know, you need a, a tried-and-true action star, a tried-and-true a mega star to kind of build this universe from and he's a perfect choice for this and it looks like the 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 the, the whole shots the, the pacing everything about it looks like it's it knows what it's doing and it's doing that right mix of action and like hardcore uh adventure and you get russell crowe just the two seconds of russell crowe super excited to see him come into that situation so to me i couldn't be more happy and the james whale reference is great because it's an homage to people who remember these kinds of things and these films still echo nowadays i mean you do collider nightmares you must know people still love these old school horror films and they they're the foundation of what make what builds their love of horror uh the first off the the <laughs> The poster I like because, yeah. you know, you have a big star like Tom Cruise, and I know later on they're going to put his face all over the posters. But right. at least this poster right now, they have his name in there, but they're focusing more on the mummy. So it's a, a nice tease. And as far as the teaser to the teaser, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, for the 15 seconds we saw, it was pretty cool. I mean, you see Tom Cruise in there, and immediately I'm thinking Mission Impossible. Yeah. Jack Reacher 2 I don't want to talk about. Oh, well. um, but you see him is swimming underwater. You have the overhead shots of the helicopters in the desert. So you get that action adventure feel, plus that supernatural. I'm with Perry though. That that shot near the end in the, with the mummy. Yeah. And the and the pupils, the eyes like splitting apart. That was really cool. So I'm excited to see the full thing on on Sunday. I was surprised that they showed Russell Crowe for, for mm -hmm. even that two seconds. I mean, it's not even the whole trail, and they they're already 
putting it, putting him in there. Yeah, I yeah. think, it's, but it's so great to have that uh, the idea of the because uh, people love the Jekyll and Hyde character, right? Yeah. And you pick a great a good actor like a great actor like Russell Crowe and give him that. It's just it's just smart it's what yeah. they're doing. With smart this. marketing and yeah. Sophia Boutella right now. Mm-hmm. Wow, you know I knew she was great when we saw her in Kingsman, but oh, yeah. her career has just completely skyrocketed, and she could be fantastic in this part. I'm so excited to see more of her now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, especially if if they make her more threatening and make her like an actual like you're scared of her versus mm-hmm. just a CGI, you know, whatever. Right. Well, there's no doubt that's what we're going to get. I mean, when you think about I never saw Star Trek Beyond, so I don't know what she did in that movie, but She's thinking yeah. thinking back to Kingsman and just the phys- the physicality of her performance and how intimidating she was because of what she did. There were some digital effects obviously yeah. because of what the character was. But most of that was her. She came from, I believe it was those Nike dance commercials, which mm-hmm. are absolutely incredible if you haven't seen them. But right. there is no doubt in my mind that they're not going to bathe her in CGI in this movie, and they're going to actually let her do her thing, which would serve the movie well. Right. Plus you have Kurtzman directing, you have McCoy mm-hmm. writing. These are all positive things. And then even the idea of Johnny Depp. I think Johnny Depp is going to get resuscitated here with what's going on with Fantastic Beasts, with what's going on with Invisible Now he's going to play Invisible Man in this universe. These are all positive things. Things. Like you find these foundational people then put them in positions just at the twilight of their careers where they still have enough to give and still have enough to show their talent and give them these challenges. And I think it's good. Like, I think this, this seems really, I'm just super excited for it. Yeah, I mean, once they start casting these really big name actors, you know, like, look, I mean, I like Luke Evans, but when he did the, the Dracula movie, right. like he's not a big name star that's going to pull people in. Yeah. This is telling people, look, we're serious. We're putting serious money behind these. I guys. still think that that could have been a great movie and it was kind of butchered down the line. There Untold. was there was so yeah. much great material that they were working with early on in the process during like script and shooting and a lot of what we learned on the set visit was not in the final film, mm-hmm. and that's the kind of stuff that I think could have made that a much more interesting story. Yeah. All right, uh, now we're on to buy or sell. Uh, Sinead, what do we got first? Disney has released the first clip from Rogue One online. In the clip, Jen and Cassian fight off some stormtroopers, showing fans a good mix of a war movie in space with some humor centered around Alan Tudyk's motion capture droid K2SO. We're now in the home stretch as fans everywhere secure their tickets for the December 16th release. Roka, do you buy or sell the first clip from Rogue One? Okay, I buy the clip. I sell the idea of releasing a clip, though, because I just want to go into this blind and enjoy this movie. Um, But it was a fun clip. You get the old school stuff of the stormtroopers being unable to shoot, which we're going to have to make that concession, you know, unable to hit people that they're actually aiming at. We're going to have to make that concession as we go into this movie theater. We see that going in now with this movie. I do like the comedic moment with K2SO. That was so fun. And his reaction to it, we got to get to hear more than just, you know, I won't kill you this time. We get a little joke. So we understand. They're going to have the vibe of the old school Star Wars stuff, but it's still going to have that kind of uh, grittier feel. And so I, I totally buy the clip. I just wish they hadn't released anything. So I just want to go in cold and see this film because I'm super excited. Uh, I buy this <laughs> clip as well. Uh, I mean, I, I think, you know, for what we do, it's a little hard to like go in cold. We got to watch right, all I the know. trailers, got to watch all the <laughs> clips, talk about it, you know, and then b- it being someone who's almost done with Catalyst, you know, I'm super. Look, I'm not going to say. There's nothing that can compare to the anticipation to Force Awakens because right. that was a Star Wars movie coming out in such a long had been such a long time. Much like right before Phantom Menace, that anticipation you're not going to replicate that. But Rogue One, I'm looking forward to for a different reason because I'm reading this Catalyst book and, and learning about uh, uh, Jin's father, right. Galen Erso. And so now when I watch the film, there's going to be all these things that I'm thinking about that I read in the book that I'm going to see. I mean, I know most people that are going to see the movie will not have read it, but that's where my anticipation comes from. And you're right. This clip gives the feel of Star Wars. You have that action adventure. You have that comedy. It it all seems like it feels like Star Wars. Yeah. Perry? Bye. (laughs) I want everything I can get from this movie. And and not to keep repeating it, but... Catalyst is a a pretty big game changer for me where I was already so, so excited for this movie after reading that book and feeling like I'm already in this particular realm of the Star Wars universe just makes me want to take every bit of content I can get right now. I hear what you're saying about clips. It's definitely... One of those marketing situations where, yeah, I think it'd be better off going blind into every single movie we ever see, but... Yeah. You know, marketing, money, business, all that stuff. And I always love when I do get my first clip just because 
Trailers are cool, but trailers are a completely different style than an actual feature film. So the clip is the first time you're really going to get a solid sense of tone, of pacing, of style, of performances. And that's what I think I get here. The Stormtrooper comment is very fair. That's mm -hmm. a lot of people it's, it's okay she's up that. against. Yeah, yeah. However, she sold it pretty damn well. Mm -hmm. I did believe within the context of this, you know, 60 second clip, whatever it was, that she was capable of taking them down. And the K2SO thing, I think, was really, really funny, made me smile, and goes to show when you have a person playing the character, just like the little nuance in his body <laughs> movement, because that's what made that moment so funny. Mm -hmm. Not that, not his line after, it was that quick moment where he was like, like, <laughs> you just shot that one that you, that could have been me, you know? Yeah. It was that paired with the line that made it so funny, so. I, I'm a little more excited now if that's even possible at this point. And, and I like the status they established. Like, he shoots a couple, but she steps up, takes them all out physically, then shoots a couple herself, then shoots K2. So so you understand, she is the leader here, right? Everyone is going to take, and it was it's the clip does a really good job of establishing that in that short amount of time, you understand who is in charge here and her physical movement. So she can do it all, and I think that's a good thing to establish walking into the theater. We understand who is going to be I think this also team. with the, the stormtroopers <clears throat> thing, like you have to keep it consistent, yeah, right? Of course. If, if they're shooting horribly in, you know, in, in mm. A New Hope right. and beyond, you're going to all of a sudden they can't be sharpshooters. I mean, you could do that actually more so like with the new trilogy and say, oh, right. these new type of troopers have gotten better at well, shooting. It could also be a comparison to the death troopers. Maybe right. we'll see them in action and yep. they'll be, you know, sharpshooters right on point. And then you got the, the regular kind and, and yeah, they all still suck. I don't have a problem with it. I think it keeps the tone up because that's what people were complaining about. Are they going to make Rogue One different than A New Hope? Make it more like a, a part of another universe? But they haven't. They've established it that these stormtroopers are terrible shots sometimes and that's okay with it. I don't have any problem with it. I think it's good that it, they're paying homage to it. All right. All right. What's next? <clears throat> Most of the world has only seen the trailer for Martin Scorsese's Silence, but there are some critics who have caught the full film and they're sharing their reactions on social media. Some are calling the film a masterpiece, highlighting how absorbing and moving the experience is, with others even suggesting that it could be a contender for best picture. However, there are some who found themselves on the other end of the spectrum, calling Silence frustrating and stilted in part. Overall, the movie seems on par with some of Scorsese's other films and should be a part of the awards conversation when it debuts on December 23rd later this month. Dennis, do you buy or sell the mostly positive reviews of Silence? Well, we did a Collider news piece on it yesterday, and I did that. I did the trailer review, review and reaction <laughs> with Schnapp. Martin Scorsese is my favorite director. Yeah, I mean, I, I buy it. I, You know, people like Drew McWeeny and Chris Tapley, people that we respect over here at uh, Collider, they, they, they seem to love it. I mean, not everyone, but no movie's going to get 100%. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm super excited. People, there's comparisons to Scorsese's other movie, Kundun, which I also love. Mm -hmm. He's one of his kind of more quieter films. You know, it, Scorsese didn't get quite the credit in terms of diversity that 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 people think. You know, he only does gangster films, but he also does kind of kind of these smaller, quieter films. And I loved Wolf of Wall Street. This movie has been a long time coming. So I and then I am gonna be seeing it soon. So <laughs> I can't I can't wait, Perry. I think I'm going to be seeing it soon, <laughs> too, and I'm really excited. But yesterday when we did the, the Collider News video, I don't think I've ever seen Dennis that happy and enthusiastic, and it made me so happy that you were so excited about that story. But I, I have to buy it. I'm really looking forward to it, too. He's not my favorite director ever, but he's a director that I really admire, and I, I like pretty much all of his films. Mm -hmm. So I'm really hyped about this, although... I'm trying not to take them to heart too much just because I don't want them to guide me in any specific direction. And, you know, when you read something like that, it's hard not to read someone else's response and then be like, oh, I wonder, I wonder if I'll have that reaction. And I could already see just by reading tweets it pushing me and, you know, trying to make me think about which way I will fall. But yeah. the positives heavily outweigh any negatives I've seen at this point. So... It does sound like this could be a contender. One tweet, I forgot, I should have wrote down who tweeted this out, but someone said that it could be a best picture contender and like watch out La La Land. Mm. And I got all, like, <laughs> I want I Silence that, to be good, was, but I I'm, think that was Chris Tapp. Was it? Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm like, no, like La La Land must win ever. I was so happy the other day, not to get off track, when La La Land got the most amount of uh, nominations from BFCA. 
yeah. special movie. So si- Silence has a lot of competition for me right now. Yeah, Snyder pushed back on that on Twitter. He said, no. Good for him. Yeah, he's, I think he pushed back on that from what I read. Uh, okay, so here's my thing. Dennis and I are probably going to have disagreement here again. Ooh. I did not like the trailer. It felt like the mission, a sequel to the mission, which I love, one of my favorite movies. And I f- was really concerned that they're casting, again, white actors to play these Portuguese. I'm just, to me, it just really bothers me a little bit. You know, we're still doing this stuff. And so it puts me back a little bit. I just didn't feel that excitement that I would normally feel for a Martin Scorsese film. So some of these negative comments, I'm not surprised to read some of these negative tweets because I was a little concerned after coming out of watching the trailer. However, it's Martin Scorsese. So I'm buying this absolutely because I want to give it a shot. And obviously Wolf of Wall Street was great. Another thing, what you were talking about, Age of Innocence, good film that no one talks about that he directed, which out of the mainstream of what he normally does. Yeah. So Martin Scorsese has shown that he can jump into these different types of films and really do great work. And so I'm looking forward to it. I'm excited to see it. There's little things that, that worry me, but other than that, I'm, I totally buy it. Okay. All right, what's next? <clears throat> Deadline reports that Sony Pictures has set Rodney Rothman to write and possibly direct the female-led 21 Jump Street spinoff movie. The concept had has been floated for a while, along with a separate film that would be a mashup of 21 Jump Street stars Jonah Hill and Channing Tatum colliding with the Men in Black franchise. However, that project remains up in the air. The report does not mention if this Jump Street spinoff will follow new characters or will instead turn the spotlight to the existing team of undercover officers Fugazi and Junior Junior that were played by Dakota Johnson and Rai Rai in the 2012 original. A release date has not been determined. Roka, do you buy or sell Rodney Rothman writing and possibly directing the female spinoff of Jump Street? Yeah, I, I buy this. I, I, I think this would be fun. I, I think different than Ghostbusters, this is something else, right? This is something that we can see a buddy. I love The Heat. The Heat is one of, people don't mm-hmm. talk about uh, how, how, how much fun that that movie is with Sandra Bullock and uh, Melissa McBride that's such a fun movie McCarthy. so McCarthy. M- Melissa McCarthy sorry and so it's, it's to me it's I would a- watch one with <laughs> yeah, Melissa McBride <laughs> Girl. Uh, Maybe so no. she should be in this movie. Yeah, well, uh, this looks so much fun. And I like Rodney Rothman as a writer. I mean, he wrote for David Letterman. He wrote for the Academy Awards. He, he wrote for Committed. Obviously, he wrote 22 Jump Street. Get him. He produced uh, Get Him to the Greek, Five Year Engagement. These are Forgetting Sarah Marshall. These are all good things to have on your track record, on your resume. So to me, absolutely, I buy this and want to give it a shot and see how much fun it could be. And why not? And it's an interracial buddy cop, so we have that lethal mm-hmm. weapon kind of vibe to it already walking into it. Plus, I think when uh, certain actresses uh, are given the right roles to play in these kinds of like tongue-in-cheek, fun, action-type movies, they really soar, and the audience goes with them. And so I would totally be on board with this, so I totally buy it. Yeah, but they're not for sure going to go with those existing characters. They might spin it off. I think they might do something else with more known actors. Oh, you think? Actresses for it. Um, Yeah, it's not like the Ghostbusters thing. At least I hope people don't get up in arms. One... They're taking, you know, uh, a franchise which, look, let's be honest, most of the people who watched 21 Jump Street or 22 Jump Street that that liked it and loved it had no idea or never watched the original 21 (laughs) Jump Street TV show. Right. I mean, I saw a little. I mean, that came out when I was in junior high. I mean, that was a long. Did it? Yes. Junior high? Yes. Long, long time ago. Um but so it's. I was it's, on my third wife. Yeah. Yeah. No, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. Go. Ahead. But yeah. But it's not one of those beloved things where people were like, "Oh my God, Twenty One right. Jump Street!" Like, so I think any kind of uproar for this would be uh, totally disingenuous. Um, and also, <clears throat> I, I feel like this is is something where where yeah, they're taking that existing universe and just kind of pushing. You know, where where I think a lot, some people's problem with Ghostbusters they disregarded. The, the 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 Bill Murray one completely and didn't right. like go off of that. Uh, I don't know, Perry. What do you think? I'm I'm a little mixed on this. If I'm specifically looking at Rodney Rothman right now and whether or not to buy or sell his involvement, I'll buy it given his track record in other positions in terms of right. filmmaking. But also because I think he's the one they have scripting um, Men in Black and the 21 Drum Street crossover. If which they're going to do if, it, yeah. because yeah, Jonah Hill, I think, has said that it's unlikely that they'll ever do it. But right. if he did turn in a script for that and it was good, that only bodes well for the script for this movie. So that's cool. But the way Sony's been handling this one in particular makes me nervous, just with bringing on different writers. And then there was that whole report where they're doing the dual track thing, which doesn't necessarily 
wind up giving you the best results when you have two people working on some with two different groups of writers or two different people whatever working on two separate ideas and then you you mishmash whatever works best you, you just don't end up with a cohesive idea so i didn't like that but clearly they're you know restructuring right now and they're taking a different approach which could be better it's just you know with with sony and the way they're handling this it just it's made me nervous every step of the way but I like the idea. I'm a big fan of 21 and 22 Jump yeah. Street. I wouldn't mind if they kept Dakota Johnson around because I think she deserves a little more credit than she's getting, largely because of the Fifty Shades franchise, which I know a lot of people out there are not big fans of. So, But she did, you know, I don't know if any of you guys saw How to Be Single, but that's a movie that I think deserves a lot more credit than it got with her and Rebel Wilson. And she was really good in it. Like, she was funny. The movie was still kind of heartfelt. I thought that was great, and it shouldn't have been overlooked like it was. So, you know, if it comes a time when we get this this movie and she is one of the leads in it, I think think i could get behind that yeah. all right all right before we move on a lot of you guys were in the chat room mentioning that that the assassin's creed trailer was a fake trailer and apparently it has been confirmed it is a fake trailer what? What? basically what uh -huh. had happened was an well, employee uh, at ubisoft, ubisoft yeah uh's email got hacked and so they sent it out from a, a legitimate what? ubisoft dot com email to everyone telling them this is some new trailer so <laughs> it, apparently it was a fake trailer wow. so thank god yeah. for oh. that that's why you were like this is all footage we've already seen just set to crappy music yeah <laughs> and, and it was uh yeah really really bad well that's a uh, shame because that could affect so could we're apologize to everyone for uh yeah. reporting that as a real thing because it was not okay. that's not cool yes. all right uh what's next Orion Pictures has released the first Red Band trailer for The Belko Experiment. The movie is written by Guardians of the Galaxy's James Gunn and directed by Wolf Creek's Greg McLean. The film takes place at a remote office building where the unsuspecting employees are thrown into a twisted experiment where they're forced to kill each other or else an explosive in their heads will be detonated. The movie will be released on March 17th, 2017. Perry, do you buy or sell the first trailer for The Belko Experiment? I buy it. It's not a strong, strong buy because... I was really excited for this movie. I like the people involved, James Gunn and James Gunn, obviously. And I really like the concept, even though, yes, I know anytime you have a situation like this, it's always like, oh, it's a Battle Royale knockoff. People say that about the Hunger Games, too. But this, to me, is, is kind of like my kind of horror. I don't mean, you know, like the best of the best, like really original or anything like that. I, I just mean the kind of horror I could have a lot of fun with. So I had really high hopes for this trailer when it came out. I wouldn't say the trailer met my, I, the trailer did not meet my expectations. However, I don't think it was a bad trailer either. I actually think the one thing that could have been changed in this trailer to make me even more positive about this movie and hopeful about the final product is if they remove the stupid bit about the chips in their head. Because mm. this is a hard concept to buy into at all because, I, I mean, we work in an office. And anyone who works in an office, this is absurd. This is ridiculous and it couldn't happen. When you add something even more absurd, like, oh, I'm going to take a job at a facility that will put a, a thing in my head. Mm. Re I, really? So, uh, you know, that would have saved this trailer a little more for me, but obviously it will come up in the feature film. So, mm -hmm. you know, at this point, the trailer wasn't the greatest thing. It wasn't everything I was hoping for. I'm still excited to see Belko Experiment. Yeah, I'm going to buy it as well. I, I think not so much. I'm not going to run out in theaters and see this film, but maybe I'll, I'll watch it on Netflix or VOD or something like that. I buy it because it falls in line with kind of the, the Bloomhouse model, which is get some sort of movie that like The Purge, where it's like has this hook for people like, what would you do in this situation? It's cheaply made. Uh, I got an idea. What? We're going to do this at this maybe, office. Maybe that's... <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Maybe, no, maybe that's like a big... That would kind of make sense if it was like a big reveal. Actually, it takes place during the daytime. But like if it was a big reveal where the the... the the, the M. Night Shyamalan twist was actually this is taking place within the world of the Purge. Oh, you know? Nice. It, Connected it's that. It's do, never... Do the, the 10 Cloverfield Lane thing where it's like, it has nothing to do with it. That, they want to make some more money, so they they just loosely attach yeah, right. it. Maybe it's just because John Gallagher Jr. is also in this movie, yes. but that is exactly where my mind went. However, I guess it wouldn't be possible because uh, Blumhouse 
uh, this is a BH, BH Tilt movie, mm. not Blumhouse. And because I think the, the beginning lockdown takes place during the daytime, which mm. The Purge only starts at a, a certain point after right. dusk. Yeah. What's going on with, uh, I saw that the Orion Pictures uh, mm. logo right at the beginning. Right? Is that now a resurrected thing? Because yeah. that's like that's TriStar kind of, was. That's it's like weird. a that's a blast from the past. Yeah. Um, Roka, what do you think? Oh no, it's it, this is not for me. So I okay. sell it. It's not really my type of film. I, it, I, Wendy and I were talking off camera, and she mentioned that it, it had has residents of battle royale, and she's right. That that mm -hmm. whole idea of the chip thing, which you mentioned, Perry, it's absolutely like if this was like set in the future. Okay, I can allow that. Right, that possibility. Who knows what we're going to be like? Barcodes. We've seen that since THX 1138. So it's like to me, it, it wouldn't be surprising to set something like. Like this in the future but this seems like now and the, why would you work in an office where they implant stuff in your head I mean also it has shades of Kingsman remember they were doing that in Kingsman too with uh, Samuel Jackson putting that stuff in people's necks so this that kind of thing takes away plus there's not a lot of really name actors that make me want to go see this like I love Tony Goldwyn I'm a big fan of Michael Rooker John C. McGinley who's great on uh, uh, Stan and the Evil Dead or whatever. a lot of that's character actors yeah a lot of here. character actors but nobody that's really gonna hook me to go see this thing mm -hmm. and so to me you're gonna need that and it has shades of devil I think with the one in the elevator the shop Milan did. It has this kind of weird vibe to it that to me just does not appeal to my tastes in, in this kind of thing. So I sell the trailer, but I totally respect the fact that you two want to buy it. Yeah. Uh, Sinead, <laughs> I know you have uh, strong opinions about this uh, new trailer. <laughs> uh, what did you think? Um, I thought it was terrible. <laughs> I think it is such a cheesy, unoriginal, <laughs> ridiculously absurd idea it makes zero sense to me and the my biggest issue is um how unrealistic it is that you would accept a job that that you are he says it so nonchalantly too he's like oh yeah they put this tracker in the back of my head and he touches it and it's like no i don't i don't think that it's it makes any sense and therefore like i couldn't buy the trailer at all because i was so detached from that idea and it just seems so not original i feel like i've seen this idea so many times where it's like your moral code and it's like what what choice would you make but it's like at the end of the day it's so unrealistic and if that were to happen in real life if someone was like kill this person or you'll be killed like no one just starts a ginormous war like it, it, there's so much more humanity that I think would go through someone's brain before world war three erupted on the seventh floor of like a bank building. It makes no sense to me. So you're going to the midnight screening. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> just, uh, number one fan, like <laughs> that uh, foam finger. I'm there. 100%. I'll buy you all tickets yeah. too. Yes. Uh, Wendy, what did you think of this trailer? I, you know, at the beginning when the, the guy's head first blew up, I was like, oh, it kind of got me. I didn't see it coming. And then as we watched more and more, I leaned over to Roka and I said, this looks like Battle Royale, a lesser Battle Royale, in my opinion, um, in an office building. And it just didn't seem like this like thriller, scary at all. It was just like slash slash kill movie that I'm not that interested in, which kind of sucks because the cast seems great, but I don't really think I'm going to be buying like a, you know, midnight showing ticket. Don't worry, it. I got you. Thanks, Shane. <laughs> She's got me. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, now we're moving our weekly Friday segment, Box Office Predictions, brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. This is a segment of the show where we try and predict the top five movies this weekend. Uh, Perry, we always will go with you last because you're afraid that we're going to steal <laughs> your ideas. Roka, yeah. why don't you go first? How did you get so insane about this? I don't understand. I casually said she, that once and it kind of stuck. But she, I'm not going to argue like, with that. She about it during the week. She, I did do. It, she did it on Facebook last week I again do. on Friday. She I posted like her it. top five. Yeah. I enjoy yeah. it. Even I enjoy though we didn't have challenge. a show. We didn't have a show. <laughs> and she, she posted did, yeah, it yeah. anyway. Yeah. yeah. She's, uh, someone yeah. asked me. They I've never, she's they like, get this on the picks. record. Get this on the record. <laughs> right. Write it down. So I technically won because no one else ever did it. Wow. So everyone else in this room is disqualified. <laughs> <laughs> there are about a million things. Hey, that... hey, here's your participation trophy. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. I'd rather have a coffee. Okay. There are about a million words to describe Perry before I would come to competitive. And ever <laughs> since this happened, I had n I've seen a whole new side of her that I never knew existed. Because uh, I can see her going, suck it. Yeah. Number one. All right. So exactly anyway, what I do. My, number, <laughs> my number one. I would say, obviously, Moana, which I still have yet to see, which I hopefully we'll see this weekend, if not tonight. Uh, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them is number two. Please go see that. It's so much fun. I enjoyed it. Allied is doing well, which I'm surprised about. Uh, Arrival, of course. If you haven't seen Arrival, what are you doing with your life? Go see this. And Doctor Strange at number five. Pretty much standard stuff for me. Nothing. Okay. No surprises, in my opinion. Yeah, there's no big, big movies coming out this yeah. weekend. 
Uh, I have Moana at number one. I have Fantastic Beast at number two. I actually have Doctor Strange at number three. Um, during the week, it was lower on that list, but I feel like it's more of a weekend movie. So, and especially nothing yeah. big is coming out, so a lot more people are going to go and see that or see it again, mm-hmm. for that matter. Uh, four, I have Arrival doing a lot better than I expected. I, I, I really like the movie. Yeah. I just wasn't expecting that other people were going to like the movie because it's just m- much more of a slower non-spectacle sci-fi film uh and then five i have allied which i saw and i thought was was solid it wasn't great it wasn't terrible it you know there's a certain demographic that goes to these movies but i think it it underperformed uh perry what's your top i think we're all gonna have the same top two Mm -hmm. i'm definitely going moana number one and just looking back at trolls that one had a really really small weekend one to two drops so i think moana's kind of gonna crush it again like have a maybe like only a 50 percent drop if not less then definitely fantastic beast which i also think is going to hold on pretty strong the next three are, are kind of like the messy bunch because i think they're going to be really close together but i'm giving arrival the edge and i'm going arrival number three pretty much because it's doing well so far and it's getting more theaters Mm -hmm. where I think Dr. Strange is losing theaters and I feel like Allied is gonna kind of lose steam where I I don't think people are talking enough about Allied as in good word of mouth even though I think the response has been pretty positive but I most certainly have not had anyone ask me so should I go see Allied it's no should I go (laughs) should I go see Dr. Strange should I go see Arrival should I see Moana should I even see Nocturnal Animals stuff like that Mm. I'm I'm being asked about different titles so I'm gonna go Arrival 3 Dr. Strange 4 Allied 5 okay so we have different lists we do all right no we don't no need for a tiebreaker here we go no need for a tiebreaker (laughs) all right guys before we get on to a mailbag we actually want to run a clip that uh we had an interview with loving director jeff nichols that uh perry did yesterday we have a two minute clip uh, one minute two minute clip now we have looking at me like we have have the full (laughs) thing on on the youtube channel so uh check out this clip Movie making is a very long process. I mean, you said before Ruth was attached for a very long time. So times have changed and we're in a very very different period right now. So is anything different in terms of what you wanted people to take from this movie back when you first started working on it versus what what you want from it today? I mean, the story hasn't changed. It's it's Richard mm-hmm. and Mildred's story. Um, it's not mine. They did all of the hard work and uh, and they're the ones that lived through it. Um, what I've found is people's interpretation of it evolves and changes. Right now, it seems like the volume's just turned up on everything. If, if you liked the film before, it means that much more to you. If you didn't like the film before, you're that much angrier about what it doesn't represent you know, in our society. And that's happened on all my films from the beginning. I think because I make films that are slightly open-ended in a lot of cases, but they also, they just aren't very pointed in terms of telling you to, to, to think something especially this film. So the films, they kind of act like vessels for the audience. They bring their own belief systems into the theater, and they put them on the films. And and that's been really fascinating to see evolve really since May in Cannes. You know, the country was in one place in May. Mm-hmm. It was another place when we by September in Toronto, and yet another place in November now. Um, and so, I don't know, it... Um, it seems like the story's not changing, the movie's not changing, but the way people interpret it certainly is. Mm-hmm. So check out Loving. It's in theaters right now. I think it's slowly expanding. And if you want to check out the rest of Perry's interview with Jeff Nichols, who also directed uh, one of my favorite movies, Mud. He also mm-hmm. did Midnight Special or earliest year is Loving. I think he, he mentioned in that interview that he also is attached to the Alien Nation movie yeah. as well. Yeah. So, yeah, if you want to check out that out, it'll be on our YouTube channel. Now, before we move on to Mailbag, I remind you, we're going to take live Twitter questions at the end of the show. You tweet us at Collider Video. All right, what's the first Mailbag question? Mike writes, hi, Collider crew. What is your favorite closing shot in a movie? For me, it's Heat and Her. Between the cinematography, music, and emotion of each, I can't help but say, wow, whenever I see them. Love the channel and keep up the great content you turn out. Uh, Perry, uh, what do you have for this? Favorite closing shots. We've had similar questions where it's favorite endings, but this is favorite Mm. closing actual shot. Mm -hmm. Just because it's fresh in my brain, I'm not going to spoil why this is special, but I want to recommend Nocturnal Animals to people because that movie ends on a shot that 
I think given what happens in the movie and what's revealed towards the end of it, just that shot in particular, it's like, you know, that that feeling where all of a sudden you feel like you're in that shot, too. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a very haunting visual when you think about it that way. But now now for ones that people will actually remember Inception. Yes. I, yeah. You know, I know I know some folks have their issues with with that ambiguous ending. I think it is one super effective to a beautiful shot. And that score that score just makes it that much more powerful. And then I'll give a little shout out to some horror and I'll say Paranormal Activity, the first movie, because where that first movie ends, you guys have seen it, right? Yeah, love that movie. Where she comes back into the room and she crawls up to the camera and kind of like does like the eerie demon grin at the camera. That was pretty freaking chilling. And yeah, I again, I know some people don't love that movie as much as I do, but I was one of the first to see it before everybody had, had spoken about it to death. and. It, it was really damn haunting, and I pictured it for a long while after I saw that movie. Yeah, Inception was on my list as well. I really liked that, and I, you know, some people didn't care for it, but I liked the ambiguity of it, and also just that slight, like, visual and audio cue where just it slightly wobbles. Um, I have Fight Club, where you have Edward mm -hmm. Norton and Hel Helena Bonham Carter holding hands as the, the build, build, buildings are blowing up in the background, yeah. and you actually have that splice of what they had been splicing in throughout yeah. the film. <laughs> um, you know, also, oh, I also always mention this film, uh, The Wrestler with, with oh, uh, yes. Randy the Ram, yep. jumps off the top rope and he just exits frame and they, they leave that, that empty frame there. Roca? That's great, Dennis. Still a crime that Mickey didn't win the Oscar. Oh, me, yeah. Still a hey, freaking crime. It's something we can agree on. Damn right, damn right. <laughs> it's it's a great not often, shot. but we're, we're on, on the same page on this one. <laughs> Uh, I had Fight Club as well on mine, which I love. But I have The Godfather, the closing yes. of the door after Kay, and, and like you know, her looking back at him, realizing that she didn't believe. She realizes that she's stuck in this terrible situation with this uh, uh, ruthless man. Uh, the end of The Searchers, which is so fantastic. That shot of John Wayne from back through the doorway when you realize he has spent seven years trying to find his niece. Now that he's accomplished this. He has no other purpose in life, and it's so he turns his back and walks about it, back out into the wilderness. And that's so, just as a man watching that, you feel this connection to it. It's so great. And I would say the end of Seven Samurai, that last shot of Seven Samurai with the swords in the graves, which is so powerful because we, have obviously, we obviously feel the passing of the certain samurai that die in the film. Uh, and then you have this feeling that the, the villagers go on, everything is great, but then they go back to that shot. And I love that shot because it lets you feel again the sacrifices that must be, that were made for this happy ending. And that's it's so powerful. Yeah. All right, guys, that's it for Mailbag. Now to your live Twitter questions. Uh, Wendy, what do you got picked out? First one comes from Nolan Dean, who writes, Since you brought up the mummy, who do you think should play Dracula in this universe? I pick Alan Cumming. Uh, no, absolutely not. I'm sorry. Harry, no. you, you have any idea? I'm even though I didn't love Dracula Untold. Like I said before, I think that movie had more potential, and I also think Luke Evans is a very talented actor. So, I say give him another shot. And it's not like he himself needs to earn that other shot. I think he just needs better material, and he deserves it. I say keep him in the role. Uh, I'd go with uh, Tom Hiddleston. Uh, I think okay. he kind of has that vi vibe to him that that he could get off with playing a, a, a vampire. Oh, that's tough. But what did we just with Brad? I mean, Tom Cruise already did it in Interview with the yeah. Vampire, so you can't. You have to take him out. Uh, I don't know. It's tough for me. Uh, there's there's so many different people, but I like Javier Bardem. Javier Bardem would be fantastic. Mm. I think is an a totally out of the box. Yeah, out of the box choice. Plus, he's already he's got he's an established strong actor. He's played villains before, mm -hmm. and he can play both sides of it. Uh, I think Mads Mikkelsen is another possibility. Mm -hmm. Mads Mikkelsen, oh, that's right? a good call. Mads, Mads, a great, a great, and we're seeing him kind of making a little bit of a renaissance now, getting bigger roles, which he should have gotten after Casino Royale as well. So it's it's good to see him like these. So I think those two choices would be fun to play with Dracula because you need someone that can hang with the Johnny Depp and hang mm -hmm. with the Tom Cruise that's believable and can have that. Power can be seductive mm -hmm. and also uh, uh, terrifying, you know, like Gary Oldman was. As much as people bash that Coppola film, he's a great Dracula in that film. A great Dracula. Uh, Sinead, who do you think would be a good Dracula? Um, are we going like younger or older? Does it matter? Doesn't matter. 
Mm, when do you go first? Let me think. Well, Dennis <laughs> took mine so, because I was going to go with Tom Hiddleston. I think he's uh. got the look. I think he's got, you know, uh, in, in previous villain roles like Loki, I, I can really see him pulling something off. And, and he also has that, like, seductive, so, uh, you know, like, air of him. I can't him. not see that. <laughs> really? I don't, no, I don't see it. Maybe it's just because I see him as being more of, like, a like a goofy villain, but, like, a, in, a, <laughs> in a good way. I love him as Loki, but... I can't see him like that. For me, Dracula has to like Older, drip maybe. like some sort of arrogance. Maybe I don't really Jeffrey get that Dean Morgan. Him. Oh, maybe. the, the other Harvey Arbide name? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Well, he's doing a great job on, on The Walking Dead, yeah. which, by the way, you can see us three people here on, on that panel. Dennis is a regular now. Yeah. Yeah. I'll yeah. make yeah. up one and write it on Facebook later. Okay. <laughs> All right, what's next? I want to bite. <laughs> Carl. 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 All right, Carl. next one comes from Delcia April. And uh, they write, greetings from Indonesia. It's 2 a.m. here. Oh, I was geez. wondering which movie character is the closest to your personality? <laughs> Wreck-It Ralph. <laughs> I mean, Wreck-It Ralph, that's me. I feel like I'm not quite the good guy all the time. And I, mess, I can physically mess stuff up on accident. I'm clumsy like that. But I got a good heart. I just want to grab that gold medal. That's all. Huh. Uh, for me, it's tough. It's not a movie character. It's a TV character. It's Larry David from Curtier Enthusiasm. <laughs> like, the way that guy thinks is, like, what I'm thinking about all the time. <laughs> but just don't say it. Which, apparently, Larry David, he says, he's like, oh, this is just me saying the things that I, know I would say if it were socially acceptable. It's weird answering this about <laughs> yourself. I I don't know the the ones that come to mind most recently just because they're fresh in my I've actually never thought about this which is weird to me, but I'd probably I saw a little of myself in Catherine Waterston's character in Fantastic Beasts mm. just because she cared so much ab about what she was doing and she wanted to be seen like in good favor and rise in the ranks and do a good job which is something that's very important to me and then. If you haven't seen Edge of Seventeen, I think just about any young woman growing up in a suburban family like that can identify with not necessarily what Haley Steinfeld's character does in that movie, but what she's feeling. So those are the two that come to mind right now. Wendy, uh, if you had a movie character or in my case, a TV character hmm. that you're most similar to or that reminds me of yourself. I have two that I can't really, I don't know which one I want, so I'll say both. And they're both animated characters, both dressed in green, ironically. One is Toph from Avatar The Last Airbender, <laughs> and the other is Discuss from uh, Inside Out. Okay. <laughs> yes, Sinead? right? I, right? Um, I would choice. say I'm probably the most like Rapunzel from oh. Tangled. Oh my God, yes. Um, because she is. <laughs> A little neurotic and loud, <laughs> but also she just wants more all the time and she's never satisfied, which yeah. is pretty much me. Okay. <laughs> I'm very proud of our, our crew here for not naming like some like crazy like, oh, I'd be like Brad Pitt or oh, Tom yeah, Cruise or, you know, like someone, I am you know, like some uh, perfect uh, leading man <laughs> or leading woman type of thing. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's do one more. All right, this one comes from Rocky Drago, 66, who writes, Are you guys worried Sophia Butella as the mummy is going to be another enchantress from Suicide Squad? I don't know how you can get worse than that, to be honest. That's why I'm not worried. I mean, there is, you know, a little bit of concern. But, I mean, even just that short little bit from that 15-second trailer already looks much more intimidating and scary than than this mm -hmm. thing that we saw at the end of Suicide Squad. I don't know what that is. I just, the bar is so low, I don't think you can get lower than that. Yeah. No, because this is exactly what I said when we had that discussion. I don't, based on what I saw in that teaser, I don't think they are doing the CGI bathed version of a villain. And given what Sofia Batella is naturally capable of and why she's a star now, I don't understand why you would cast someone like her in that role with those physical abilities and then just ruin it. So mm -hmm. no, I don't think it's gonna be that at all. Okay. Yeah, a little more ruthless. You have a stronger foundation in Sophia than you do in Kara. Sophia mm -hmm. has way more power, way more talent bringing to this to bring to this character than Kara does with the sorceress. And so for me, I have no doubts that she's gonna be fantastic in the mummy. No doubts. 
All right, guys, that's it for today's episode of Collider Movie Talk. Thanks for joining us. I want to thank the people at the table with me. Roka, where can people find you? Guys, you can always find me at the Roka Says on Twitter and on Instagram. Uh, see all the shows I'm co-hosting and hosting and being a guest on. Uh, so the Cinephiles, we just dropped Apocalypse Now this morning, so please go and listen to that. Find it on iTunes and on Stitcher. And every Wednesday, 1 p.m. on the Geek & Sundry Twitch channel, Super Animation Game Time. We just interviewed Ginny McSwain, J.P. Carliac, a bunch of people, uh, and, and Carrie Payton. And all, I mean, we're going to be interviewing Carrie Payton soon so it'll be fun to go and, and, and listen to us do that Perry you guys can catch me on Twitter and Instagram at P. Nemiroff Collider Nightmares every Wednesday morning there's Best of the Week on Saturday Mailbag on Saturday Walking Dead Recap Show and After Ash every Sunday night I think that's it I'm probably forgetting something oh <laughs> go watch the Loving interview too because that's that's cool Sinead yeah. <laughs> where can people find you I'm here on Mondays hosting TV Talk and Fridays hosting Movie Talk. I'm finally back on Mailbag this weekend. Yeah. And I'm also online at Sinead DeFries and at that's so Sinead.com. Wendy? You can find me on YouTube at the Movie Couple channel and on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat at Wendy Lee Zaney. Uh, also, I forgot to mention that there's going to be a schmodown between Finstock and Sam Levine Ooh. today at 2 p.m. Also, yeah, we have uh, Mailbags on Saturday and Sunday, Best of the Week also. And then we have Movie Talk back on Monday, you can find me on Twitter at Think Hero, on Instagram, Dennis.TZNG. Don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Collider Videos, and we'll see you guys next time. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.